What did you have for breakfast this morning? Uh, what did I have? I had scrambled eggs, actually. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Is that yeah. your usual? No. Um, I have to take all these drugs in the morning now, so one of the hideous things about being old is, and uh, so I have to eat, because they all require you to eat something, which is, I've never eaten breakfast in my life. <laughs> now I have to. Canada. More Canada is a report that was put together uh, by a team led by a veteran publisher, James Lorimer, and uh, it, uh, uh, it cites some very alarming statistics on uh, what is happening to, uh, to sales of uh, Canadian books. Uh, the statistics, the main statistic that it gives is that uh, uh, books by Canadians sold in Canada have, uh, have been holding fairly steady at uh, approximately one quarter of the market. 25% of uh, book sales in Canada are uh, written, by, uh, written by Canadians. But that figure has uh, dropped recently to, it's dropped by 50% to approximately 12.5%. Now, the report uh, makes several recommendations, but what I'd like to ask you first, Brian, is um, when you read the report and you saw that statistic of the, uh, the, uh, a really quite significant decrease from 25% to 12.5%, uh, uh, what, uh, what was your initial reaction? Well, my initial response was not to be surprised but uh, not to accept their explanation for it as, as the correct one. I mean, I think what we've, what was, what caused that in effect is that Canadian, small Canadian publishers have, first of all, fundamentally lost their means of distributing books because our largest bookseller in the country arbitrarily from time to time decides not to stock their books and has a merchandising system in which, for instance, if you want your book prominently displayed in their stores, you have to pay them anywhere from two to $12,000 or more. Uh, so no small publisher in the country can compete on, 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 on that level. Right. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I think there's more to it than, than uh, than simply the, the bookseller. I mean, you've got, you've got a book distribution system called BookNet, which tracks the sales of books and which the largest bookseller in the country um, now uses to uh, make orders, you know, to take orders for books. So, for instance, if your last book, which didn't win a prize and was therefore dumped by your publisher, um, sold 343 copies, which is the average number of books sold by small Canadian publishers these days. This is one of the statistics that really caught my eye, because right. I think it's probably accurate. Right. Um, if, you're, if you found yourself as, as, a, as, a, as an author in that situation, first of all, the publishers are now using the BookNet statistics to decide what to publish, and they're being dictated in that by the largest bookseller in the country, and uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so you, what we have is a piece of software which is flawed, and which, interesting enough, has no way of tracking Canadian authored books. Right, mm. it's one of their recommend recommendations, which I completely agree with is that that software has to be radically um, updated so that it can do that amongst other things 
and I'd recommend that it can't not be be done, uh, not be used to, to recommend what books ought to be published. <clears throat> because in effect, what you, what you have is a situation where you have a single bookseller dictating what books, not only what books are bought by them, but what books are published by the publishers. Because mm -hmm. they'll send back a notice if, you know, the, what the booksellers now do is, is they'll create a catalog which announces the book, and if they don't get orders, they kill the book. And what's killing, what the, what's creating the stats for that is the book name. Uh, Stephen Hennigan wrote an interesting piece uh, a while back on, uh, on uh, BookNet, and he was very critical of it. Mm -hmm. um, that piece, I think, appeared in Geist, and I think it was a few years old. I've noticed on social media that if there's an ogre uh, that uh, the Canadian literati likes to, uh, likes to focus on, it's Amazon. Is there, uh, what do you think the explanation for that is? Is, is <clears throat> Amazon sort of a, a kind of a Well, Am Amazon is seen as, as like the, the big bad guys. My sense of Amazon is that they're much better than the largest bookseller in the country. Right. Um, they have no, um, no difficulty stocking the work of, or, you know, pub books published by small publishers. I mean, do you just want to do your electronic version of, you know, your, your silly novel? They're totally okay with that. And they're, and they're, if you look at the way that their book selling setup works, pretty neutral. Now, chances are they're taking a bigger discount off the small publishers than they are off the, the big guys, but that's hardly, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a flaw that, that's unique. So, my attitude is that uh, I think you, you, if you want to criticize somebody as a bookseller in this country, you go after the people who've done the damage. And, quite frankly, Amazon hasn't done much damage. <clears throat> Okay. Now, it's certainly not compared with the largest bookseller in the country. Okay. So, uh, uh, why, why do you think, uh, in other words, is, is, uh, is fear playing a role in the, 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 the sure. tendency of a lot of people that I notice online? I, I notice this among writers, I notice this among small press publishers in Canada who are active on Facebook, for example, that they, uh, they do... Uh, uh, they do zero in on Amazon. They feel great antipathy toward Amazon. They yeah, take yeah. That's clear, it's easy. clear, clear glee <clears throat> in, in publishing articles yeah. that are uh, that, that sort of highlight Amazon's uh, yeah. uh, sometimes really awful yeah. uh, treatment of its employees and so forth. Um, yeah. But the conversation tends to stop there. But if we're talking about book publishing, mm -hmm. they're not the bad guys. Right. All right. <clears throat> um, they haven't, right? they haven't done anything, and they don't do anything. For instance, one of the reasons why some of those people are whacking Amazon around is because Amazon, Amazon doesn't do anything. The largest bookseller in the country, who you notice I'm not naming, um, is punitive. Is known to be punitive. And so this, you know, the, the report that we're looking at, there's absolutely no mention. This is like this huge white elephant in the room. And they're not talking about it. If but this, this is the company that wiped out the independent book selling sector, did it 15 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, has merchandising procedures that are lethal to any small publisher. Well, and for, for example, you, nobody says these guys are not willing to, to name uh, that name because they'll be punished too. Uh, give me or an example, fear they're, of, they are uh, afraid they will be. A lethal, a lethal retail practice. What would an example of that be? Well, if, uh, say, I've got a, like a really great book, and I'm publishing with, say, New Star Books in Vancouver, which is a very good press, um, they can't even get their books into Chapters Indigo. And if, they, if, if for instance, Rolf Moore thought there was going to be a bestseller, he can't afford the five grand to get it merchandised face out. I mean, they literally charge you for having your book face out on the stacks. Right. All right? <clears throat> okay, just to explain, so the audience is clear here. By face out, you just mean 
a book that's sitting on a shelf back <laughs> yeah. way way back in in, in, in even in, there in the midst of the store. A cost. It's not at the front. It's yeah. just on a shelf. And if and, it, and if it's on out. one of the display shelves, that's another cost level. Right. Right. Uh, approximately how much yeah. would that be? Do you know? I don't know the exact figures, but I I know at one point I was told when I tried to get uh, human happiness right. merchandise properly. Right. They, the figure that I was quoted by my publisher at the time was five grand. Right. And they said, we don't have that. Right. right? We, we can't compete on that level. So what you now have, uh, you know, and nobody, you can't document this and nobody wants to talk about it, is that you have like a tier of publishers that can afford to sell a whole shitload of books in the largest publisher in the country who treats them like boxes of shoes or chocolates, right? I mean, they're, they're, they're not interested in quality. They don't hire literate booksellers. Um, they're just not interested in books. They, they, they think of it as cultural bric-a-brac, and, and one book is the same as any other book. Okay, now many years ago, um, uh, when Chapters uh, uh, was, uh, was the name of the biggest uh, publisher in Canada, uh, Philip Marchand was asked for his opinion of it. Uh, and he said, oh, he liked it because he could walk into a Chapters and uh, find copies of his book on the shelves. Uh, whereas uh, uh, beforehand, uh, he would sometimes have trouble finding his books on, on the shelves of, say, a, a, a smaller, a physically smaller bookstore. Um, has, uh, and Who's, that... Who is this? This is Philip, Philip Marchand. Oh, Phil, yeah. 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 And uh, has uh, the, the situation that you describe, especially with... Uh, uh, the, uh, the current uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> biggest retailer in Canada, yeah. uh, using, for example, an American distributor uh, to, uh, to get its books. I mean, how much has, have things changed between now, the past couple of years? Oh, I think and, it's and gone... I, I, Marshawn, I think, was referring right. to something that was like true maybe 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think when, when Chapters, when chapters like, Indigo began, right. their techniques... Their book selling techniques were much more uh, fair than they are, and, then, and much less sophisticated than they are now. And I think probably on balance, it was nice having those great big bookstores because one of the things they did was they stocked 177,000 titles. That lasted about four years. And suddenly these vast numbers of returns began to come back to publishers. That's what sunk. In effect, McClellan and Stewart started the same, the same thing. <clears throat> because there were vast numbers of books that would go out, and then you do your financial planning on that basis, and then suddenly, like, 80% of them come back. Right. Right? So, so publishers... And all, all they're doing is, is, is that they're performing a kind of uh, accounting mm -hmm. procedure, because for a long time they had... Uh, books went out in consignment to Chapters Indigo because they were so big and so powerful they could actually enforce that. Right? So what they would do is they would buy books on a 90, 90 uh, day <coughs> term <coughs> and return everything on, on the 88th day when and then reorder. When, when you say buy a book, you mean place an order for a book. The, the way it works <coughs> in the publishing industry, in other words, is that publishers will order books in uh, yeah. And they will uh, divide profit for every book sold, but books that are not sold are simply returned to the publisher. They, they do return to the public. That's always yeah. been the case, yeah. right? Um, but until Chapters Indigo, there wasn't this policy of, like, certainly initially, of totally stacking their books with their, their bookshelves with free books and then returning them. I mean, no one, no one saw that one coming, uh, and that sunk a couple of publishers. Uh, good ones too, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the, you know, it's like the the idea was that merchandising of books was go going to be the answer to everything. And well, well, what do you mean by the phrase merchandising of, of books? Could you break that down a little bit, please? Say again. What What do you mean by the phrase merchandising of books? You've used it a few times. Well, okay. In a classic, you know, the books, the bookstore of our dreams, like right. books, the way Book City was. Right. Um, they would order books, 
and the authors would come in and sign them and stuff like that. You know, like a like a good system. Right. And it was word of mouth. That the way that they sell books now, and this is the deliberate strategy, merchandising strategy, is they try to sell a great number of a small number of books. So, for instance, we now have the prize mill situation with all the awards, right? So, right. Uh, if if a publisher gets uh, the Giller nomination or wins the Giller, the they sell six or eight hundred thousand dollars worth of books, just like that, because everything inside the bookstore apparatus, including some of the small bookstores who have to compete with the largest bookseller in the country, um, they're forced to adopt the same principles, right? <clears throat> so all the, all the publicity money and all the merchandising is going towards fewer and fewer books, including a government-funded and sponsored prize mill, which I find like distasteful because it's forcing writers to just simply behave conventionally because no experimental book's going to get on any of those prize lists. So it was like we're, we're, getting, we're getting basically screwed every which way. At this when, point. when you, when you uh, talk about a prize mill, who, uh, which prizes are you thinking of specifically? Doesn't matter. The Giller, there's, there's, there's hundreds of them. You know, right. there, there are prizes for you know, people who like dogs with one leg. Right. Or write about dogs with one leg. You know, it, it's like it's gotten to the point where it's absurd and it's very destructive in the sense that, like, for instance, if you are an author whose book comes out, there's an novel, you publish a novel, and your publisher has three slots that can go into, say, the Giller competition, and you, you're number four, your book doesn't get the slot, you're dead. If it goes in, it doesn't get a nomination. They simply, and every publisher now does this, they drop it. They spend absolutely no resources on it. It doesn't matter whether the book's good or not. It's whether it got, got into the conventional behavior uh, price mill. All right? 